9 and chapter 22, we notice that Solomon begins, uh, began a new section of Proverbs referred to as the sayings or the words of the wise. The sayings or the words of the wise. And so there's, uh, within this sayings or the words of the wise, this section of Proverbs, there's also a shift in how the Proverbs are written. So instead of little one or two line Proverbs, uh, now there's more like two or four verses kind of, you know, topically brought together uh, around a particular topic. And so instead of one or two line Proverbs, we're going to see now three or four verses where he's going to cover more of a, an entire topic uh, in the Proverbs. So with, beginning with verse 1, it says, When you sit down and eat with a ruler, Consider carefully what is before you, and put a knife to your throat if you are a man given to appetite. <laughs> <laughs> you guys see any red lines there? <laughs> Do not desire his delicacies, for they are deceptive food. So he says, you know, when you're invited to eat dinner with a dignitary, don't go in and start eating up all the orders. You know, his little delicacy. I remember when uh, when we got married, uh, my mom and her friends made all the food. And it was all this Japanese food. And there was all these, you know, gyoza, which are these little dumplings that you hand make. You know, every one of them hand folded and hand made. And egg rolls and everything. There was tons of, you know, there was hours of time spent in preparing all this food. And then, uh, you know, and, and my, mom, my uncle was there, and he's kind of a big guy. He's actually bigger than Jamie, uh, and, and just around. And uh, so uh, he's about the same height as he's bigger around. And he, uh, he, you know, my uncle went first in line, and he just basically took the whole plate of egg rolls and just put it on his plate. And so, like, there was nothing left after he went through. The, the room, you know, and, and so basically Solomon says, don't do that, you know, don't be that guy, you know, uh, if you've got a big appetite, put a knife to your throat, you know, don't uh, fill up on the hors d'oeuvres, because they're deceitful, you know, those little hors d'oeuvres are deceitful, what happens, you go in and you fill up on the hors d'oeuvres, and what do you miss, it's the main course, you know, and so uh, you don't want to do that, verse 4 says, do not overwork to be rich, because of your own understanding, see. Will you set your eyes on that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away like an eagle towards heaven. You know, Jesus said, Don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. You know, and there's nothing wrong with working hard. There's nothing wrong, wrong with being rich. But what he's saying here is don't overwork yourself to become rich. What is the message behind that? Well, God is the one that blesses us. God is the one that gives us favor. And there are those that God blesses with the ability to acquire a tremendous amount of wealth. And he blesses them so that they can be a blessing to others. You know, and what I notice is that oftentimes God uses these men to bless the work of God and, and to be able to support the work of God in different places. Others are just, they're just blessed, you know, their gift is, is, uh, is to be able to work hard and be consistent and provide for their family. And they may never acquire a massive amount of wealth, but they have other ways that they contribute and they bless the body. Is one more important than the other? No. Is one more honorable than the other? No. You know, and actually what he's saying here is riches can take a wings and fly away. They can be gone tomorrow. So don't put your trust there. Put your trust in the Lord. He's the one that blesses you. He's the one that, that blesses you with these things. And so um, don't be a workaholic. You know, it's not worth it. It's not worth being a workaholic for. In verse 6 it says, Do not eat the bread of a miser, nor desire his delicacy. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. The morsel you have eaten, you will vomit up and waste your pleasant work. Uh, I remember, you know, we, we would go out and eat at a lot of different people's houses. And uh, I remember this house that we went to one night. We went in and we 
we basically, you know, you invite the David, David family over. I mean, we're, we eat everything. And uh, so we ate everything. You know, they said, hey, eat up, eat as much as you want. So we believed them, and we ate everything. And then at the end of the night, they said, wow, we, we usually have leftovers for days. <laughs> you know, we usually just, you know, it's like this meal usually lasts us a long time. Even when we have other people over, but you guys ate it all, you know. <laughs> it's like I felt like giving it back to them uh, at the end of the night. I just didn't know what to do with that. I felt bad, you know. I thought, I'll give it back to you, you can have it. Um, so uh, just, be, you know, just be aware of that. Uh, verse 9, do not speak in the hearing of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of your words. Do not remove the ancient landmark, nor enter the field of the fatherless. For the Redeemer is mighty, and he will plead their cause against you. And, you know, we saw this, actually, in the previous chapter about the moving of the ancient landmark. And, basically, again, it's saying that God will take up the cause of the widows, the orphans, and the poor. You know, He will look out for them. And, if, and as we talked about last week, you know, they would move the, the ancient landmark, the land, you know, they would move it one half of an inch here, one half of an inch there. And over the years, they would lose significant portions of land and uh, what God says is, if, if your boundaries are moved, I'm going to move them back. I'm going to be the one that picks up your cause. I'm going to plead your cause. And if you're struggling financially, here's the deal. You have an incredible ally in God. Because he's for you. He's for the poor. He's for uh, the widow and for the orphan. Verse 12 says, Apply your heart to instruction and your ears to words of knowledge. Do not withhold correction from a child, for if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. Now, you might go to jail, uh, but the child will not die. Um, you, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you will beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. Now, I believe in spanking, because I believe that the scripture teaches us that spanking is a method of correcting our children. And sometimes you have to apply the Board of Education to the seat of understanding. <laughs> um, but it's not the only method. It's not the only method. Um, my oldest son benefited greatly from spanking. You know, but if I raised my voice to my daughter, she would immediately start crying. If I looked at her, she would just break down, you know. And so I really didn't have to spank her. Um, my middle son was the same way. He's a sensitive child. And uh, you know, he's the one that, from the time he was early, was putting everything in order, color coordinated perfectly, you know, sequencing. And he was just that sensitive, observant child. And so I would just have to talk to him. And uh, I really didn't spank him much, you know. Now, I probably wish I would have a little bit more, but, um, but you know, the thing is, is that he, he was different. So, you, you need to correct your child in the way that best suits them, in the way that they're wired. It's not one size fits all. You know, sometimes our, our, our children need to be spanked. And sometimes they need just to be talked to. You know, uh, but always they need our love. In verse 15 it says, My son, if you're wise and if your heart is wise, my heart will rejoice. Indeed, I myself, yes, my inmost being will rejoice when your lips speak right things. Now, my inmost being refers to the kidneys. You know, it's the kidneys. Now, the Hebrews thought that the deepest emotions were not in the heart, but that they were in the stomach, because that's where you feel your emotions, right? And they thought your inmost being was in your kidneys because when you're, you know, when you're butchering an animal, what's the last thing you come to? The kidneys. The kidneys are the deepest thing in the body. So they would think that the kidneys would describe the inmost being of a person. You know, that's why in Scripture you have the bowels of mercy, the bowels of compassion, you know, and, and these sorts of things. Uh, in our modern day vernacular, we talk about, you know, your gut. You know, what's your gut feeling? You know, what's the, that gut level feeling? And so the dad is saying to the son, if you're wise, it will bring joy to the deepest part of me, right down to my kidneys. You know, that's what he's saying. 
Uh, verse 17, do not let your heart and be sinners, but be zealous for the fear of the Lord all the day. For surely there is a hereafter, and your hope will not be cut off. You know, don't watch television uh, and, and be J-Lo or Katy Perry. You know, don't be caught up in Bieber fever. You know, there's a whole thing right now with Justin Bieber and his recent arrest, and, you know, and, and he's trying to be a big boy. And, you know, Solomon's saying, hey, don't envy these guys because there is a hereafter. It isn't just all here and now. There's a hereafter, and when you're in that period of time, uh, our hope will not be cut off, but we can't say the same for them. You know, their hope will be cut off. Verse 19, Hear my son and be wise, and guide your heart in the way. Do not mix with wine bibbers, or with gluttonous eaters of meat. For the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, and drowsiness will clothe a man with rags. Listen to your father who begot you, and do not despise your mother when she is old. Buy the truth, and do not sell it. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. The father of the righteous will greatly rejoice, and he who begets a wise child will delight in him. Let your father and your mother be glad, and let her who bore you rejoice. My son, give me your heart, and let your eyes observe my ways. For a harlot is a deep pit, and a seductress is a narrow well. She also lies in wait as for a victim, and increases the unfaithful among men. You know, so the, the talking about the, the sedu seductress, the seducing woman that increases unfaithfulness uh, amongst men. Now, the remaining verses of this chapter are interesting in that there are a series of questions designed to get you to think about the topic that he's writing about. So he, he's now prompting us with these questions. It says, who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contention? Who has complaint? Who has wounds without cause? You know, they're just always a victim. You know, everything's always against them. Who has redness of eye? Those who linger long at the wine. Those who go in search of mixed wine. Do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. At the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. That's where Muhammad Ali got his thing. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. You know? It's like when you, when you begin drinking, you lose all your inhibition. You lose all your sense of normality. The things you would not normally say or do, now under the influence, your in inhibitions have been... Uh, loosened, and you're going to do all kinds of stupid things, all kinds of crazy things. Um, I, I, you know, we do a lot of weddings, and I tell my wife I like to leave around the time the dancing starts. You know, and the reason why is not because I don't like to dance. The reason why I like to leave around the time the dancing starts is because that's about the time that people have had a, a little bit too much to drink, and then they start doing things that embarrass themselves in public. You know, you'll have ladies in these nice gowns and there's all this jewelry and they'll be falling out of their chair off the ground, you know, and, and they can't get up because they're too drunk. And, uh, or they'll start, you know, stammering and, and you know, falling, you know, on, be on the dance floor and be kind of, you know, all over the place. And it's embarrassing. It's uncomfortable. And so, uh, and you do things that you normally would never do, you know, when you've had too much to drink. And so, uh, so I like to leave, you know, before all of that begins. I'd rather not see it. You know, I like to see people in their best light. You know, I like to see them in the, in the best way. And I don't want to have those images of them in my mind. You know, I'd rather, I'd rather, I'd rather leave at that point. And so, but he's very clear here. You know, your heart will utter perverse things. You'll say things you never would say to someone. You'll do things you never uh, would do. And verse 34 says, Yes, you will be like the one who lies down in the midst of the sea, or like one who lies at the top of the mast. You know, what is that when you're, when you're laying down, you're seasick, right? When you've had too much to drink, you're, you're kind of seasick. 
They have struck me, but I was not hurt. They have beaten me, but I did not feel it. When shall I wake that I may see after another dream? I mean, there's, it's, it's just incredible here in Scripture. We have the tragic effect of alcoholism. You can't describe alcoholism any better than this. You know, they just, you know, it's like they wake up and they're like, who hit me in the face? How did I get this? Who is this sleeping next to me? You know, what's going on with my life? They kind of lose all sense of reality. Proverbs 24 continues uh, this same format. Verse 1, it says, Do not be envious of evil men, nor desire to be with them. For their heart devises violence, and their lips talk of troublemaking. Through wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established. By knowledge the rooms are filled with precious and pleasant riches. Solomon talking about the value of wisdom and knowledge. That it's through wisdom that our homes are built, our houses are established on wisdom and it's established on understanding. And, and as wisdom comes into our house, it's, it's like our rooms are filled with these precious and pleasant riches. We can't get any better than that. There's no more richness than a house that's built on wisdom. In verse 5 it says, A wise man is strong, yet the man of knowledge increases strength. For by wise counsel you will wage your own war. And in a multitude of counselors there is safety. Wisdom is too lofty for a fool. He does not open his mouth in the gate. Now the gates were always a place of judgment. And uh, one of the places we visited in Israel was uh, uh, called Tel Dan. And as you go into Tel Dan, you'll, you'll walk and you'll see kind of a throne and there'll be a bench there where, um, uh, where, where they would hold court. And basically this is the place that they would hold court. So the king would go there every day and people from all over the region would come and they would meet with the king and the king would make judgments. They would have legal cases there. And so what Solomon's saying here is that wisdom is too lofty for a fool. You never find a fool at the gate judging the cases of other people. In other words, no one is going to go talk to a fool and ask them, what should I do in my life? They're not going to do that. They're going to go to a wise guy, someone with wisdom. In verse 8, he who plots to do evil will be called a schemer. The devising of foolishness is sin, and the scoffer is an abomination to men. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Deliver those who are drawn uh, toward death, and hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, surely we do not know this, does not he who weighs the hearts consider it? He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? And will he not render to each man according to his deed? In other words, if you have the means to help someone, if God has blessed you with the ability to help other people, and you see their need, and you do nothing to help them, or you pretend that you don't see it, or that it's not there, now, I, man, I didn't even know you had a need. I didn't even know you were going through that. He says, the Lord sees the heart. And the Lord is going to judge your heart, and He will repay you according to your deeds. You know? In other words, God blesses us so that we can be a blessing to other people. You know, God blesses us so that we can be used by God to meet other people's needs. Not just our own, but the needs of others. And so we need to be able to do that. And we can't excuse ourselves from helping someone. And by saying, hey, I didn't know, because God knows that you knew. You know, and God is going to weigh your, our hearts and will render to every man according to his work. And here's one thing that we could all, you know, kind of walk away, one area that we could really uh, search our hearts on, and that is this. That every single one of us has received the grace of God. Every single one of us has received the gospel. And we know people that do not know Jesus. And if we pretend, oh, I don't know what's going on over there. I don't know if they're a Christian or not. Maybe they are. I, you know, 
God knows our heart. And he will render to us the what you know, according to our deeds. You know. And uh, and that's one of those things. If we know our neighbors, you know, we, we have our neighbors across the street and we found out that uh, that the man was sick and we took a, a quilt over that was made, you know, a prayer quilt and and we shared the gospel with them and, and, and gave this quilt to them. He eventually went home. Uh, we don't know if he's with the Lord or, or what he may he didn't receive the, the, the Lord that day. But he was, you know, it was very interesting how they responded to us afterwards. They were very, they were, they kind of like quit talking to us after that. But the thing is, is that it's not because we didn't, you know, we can't, we can go, you know, they can't say you never told him. You know, when he's standing before Jesus, they can't say that we didn't show the love of God to them, that we didn't show concern to them. And so each one of us have been entrusted with the words of life. And he, he makes it pretty graphic here to deliver those who are drawn toward death and hold back those that are stumbling to the slaughter. You know, we want to we want to share the gospel with them. Verse 13 it says, My son, eat honey because it is good. Let's read that again. <laughs> eat honey because it is good. And the honeycomb which is sweet to your taste. So shall the knowledge of wisdom be to your soul. If you have found it, there is a prospect, and your hope will not be cut off. You know, how sweet is the knowledge of wisdom? When you get a, a nugget of truth, when you discover something in the Word of God, how sweet that is. How sweet it is to get understanding from the Lord on a particular subject. When you, you know, you're, you're just wrestling with it, and all of a sudden God just reveals it to you. It brings sweetness to your soul, you know, and so it's just important for us to seek the Word of God, to, to know the Word of God, to look for, to discover the nuggets of truth in the Word of God that we can apply to our lives. Verse 15, Do not lie in wait, O wicked man, against the dwelling of the righteous. Do not plunder his resting place. For a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity. You know, Pastor Chuck would say, there's nothing wrong with falling. There's nothing wrong with falling. Unless you just lie there and don't get up. Then there's something wrong with it. You know, everyone falls. And God knows that. God knows that every one of us falls. He knows we're just but dust. God knows we're not perfect. And the truth of the matter is that we usually expect more out of ourselves than God does. We expect more of ourselves than God does. And we're usually harder on ourselves than God is. You know, that's why when you meet people and they, they are so judgmental, it's because they're critical of themselves. You know, the, the way that they judge you is the way that they judge themselves. The pressure that they put on you is the pressure they put on themselves. It's an incredible thing to live under. We get so disappointed when we've fallen, when we fail. But here's the thing, God isn't disappointed at all. He already knew you were going to fall. He already knew you were going to fail. So you're not going to catch him by surprise. You're not going to catch him uh, in a place where he's going to say, Wow, I really hope the best for you, but man, you blew it. Let me down. God isn't going to say that. But we're so disappointed in our stuff. And here's what we need to know. God doesn't condemn us for falling. God understands and He has great patience with us. You know, it's like teaching our kids how to walk. You know, when your kids were little and you're kind of teaching them how to walk, you know, they would kind of stand up and then they would fall down. You didn't slap the kid and say, hey, you stupid kid, get back. You can't walk. What's wrong with you? You know, walk face. You should be driving the car by now, you know? <laughs> I mean, we don't do that for our kids. We pick them up, we encourage them, oh, dude, little dude, you fell down, pick them back up, you know, hey, let's try it again, you know? And we're learning how to walk in the Spirit. You know, we're learning how to walk with Jesus. And God does the same thing. When we fall down, He doesn't slap us. 
tell us how mad he is with us. He picks this up. He says, okay, keep going. Let's get back up. Let's get back in the game. Let's keep moving forward. Verse 17 it says, Do not rejoice when your enemy falls. That's hard. Do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles. You know, it's one thing when it's, you know, what's that old adage, you know, when, when it comes to me, I want mercy, but when it comes to you, I'm going to judge you. You know, and that's kind of how it is, isn't it? You know, I've been in that place many times. When it comes to me, uh, I, you know, I want, I want people to give me utmost grace, but when it comes to them, man, I want to hold them to a high standard, you know. But don't rejoice when your enemy falls. Lest the Lord see it and it displeases him, and he turn away his wrath from him. Now, this is interesting, because God says if you rejoice when your enemy falls, then he will turn his wrath away from you. You know? And so it's kind of a kind of a weird thing, but if you re- but if you don't rejoice, then God will continue beating him. You know? So don't rejoice. So God will continue beating your enemy. You know, don't, don't you rejoice when your enemy falls. Otherwise, God will let him off the hook. Kind of a reverse psychology thing. Verse 19, Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the wicked. For there will be no prospect for the evil man. The lamp of the wicked will be put out. My son, fear the Lord as a king. Do not associate with those given to change. For their calamity will rise suddenly. And who knows the ruin those two can bring? These things also belong to the wise. It is not good to show partiality and judgment. He who says to the wicked, you are righteous, him the people will curse, nations will abhor him. But those who rebuke the wicked will have delight, and a good blessing will come upon them. He who gives a right answer kisses the lips. Prepare your outside work, that's a good one for husbands. Always give right answers. Uh, prepare your outside work. Make it fit for you in the field. And afterward, build your house. Do not be a witness against your neighbor without cause. For who? Uh, for would you deceive with your lips? Do not say, I will do to him just as he has done to me. I will render to the man according to his work. I mean, that's that's something that's hard to do. We also we, we often want to say, hey, I'm going to do to you what you just did to me. You know, sometimes that happens in, a, in our house, you know, where we'll say to each other, you know, I'm going to treat you the way you treat me. If you treat me like this, I'm going to treat you like that. You know, and, and, and Solomon says, don't do that. Don't be that way. You know, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. And so if you want to take vengeance, the Lord will let you handle it. But if you want... God to handle it, then don't be like that. Let God handle it. And I find that God does a much more thorough job in handling things than I ever did. God has a, a way of just working on people's hearts in a way that, that I never thought possible. Now, from verse 30 on, we have the ode to the slothful man. The ode to the slothful man, or the lazy man song. It says, I went by the field of the lazy man, and by the vineyard of the man devoid of understanding. And there it was, all overgrown with thorns. Its surface was covered with nettles. Its stone wall was broken down. You know, when we went to Israel, you would see the way that they would divide the plots of land, is they would have these walls that were made out of rock. And they kind of would go, and then you would see them, you know, turn, and that's how they divided up the land. And and what he's saying here is that, you know, and these, these walls were, you know, they were maybe this wide and they were stacked with rocks. But here a lazy man's wall is all broken down. You know, the, the rocks are scattered. You know, there's, there's no boundaries here. They're just kind of all over the place. When I saw it, I considered it well. I looked on it and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. So shall your poverty come like a prowler, and your need like an armed man. So, you know, that's the thing. It, it might look, you might have a vacation for a while, but then all of a sudden it just overtakes you. And so, uh, the lessons from the lazy man. Chapter 25. Now, these proverbs were gathered 
by Hezekiah when he became king and added to the book of Proverbs by Hezekiah's scribes. And so, uh, if you remember, during Hezekiah's reign, uh, a revival broke out in Israel. You know, there was a great revival. The thing that, one of the hallmarks of every revival is that there is a return to the Word of God. The Word of God becomes the center of the people. And so when you see, you know, when you begin to see a real hunger for the Word of God, and I'm not talking about the preachers saying, you've got to be into the Word of God. I'm talking about the people having a hunger for the Word, and they want to hear the Word. You know, where, the, where they start filling up the churches, and they want to be where the Word of God is being uh, proclaimed and taught. They want to hear the scriptures, you know, read, and they want to know what God thinks. That's a sign of revival. And so during Hezekiah's time, there's this revival happening. And uh, in this revival, Hezekiah's scribes are looking for the Word of God. They're, they're searching for scriptures, and they stumble upon these Proverbs of Solomon. You know, we know that Solomon wrote 3,000 Proverbs. But there's only a few hundred written in the book of Proverbs. So there's many thousands that we don't even know about, that we've never read. They didn't make it into the scriptures. And so Hezekiah's scribes found these, uh, um, these proverbs and added them to the book. And so we read in verse, uh, chapter 25, verse 1, These also are proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied. It is the glory of God to conceal a man, but the glory of kings is to search out a man. You know, as the heavens for... Uh, as the heavens for height and the earth for depth, so the heart of kings is unsearchable. Take away the dross from silver, and it will go to the silversmith for jewelry. Take away the wicked from before the king, and his throne will be established in righteousness. You know, here we see again the, the reference to the removing of the dross, you know, that process of sanctification that God does in our hearts, you know, where he, he removes the drops from our lives, the impurities. And how does he do that? Through trials and tribulations, things that heat up our lives, that cause, you know, our lives to get, you know, hot, to put us kind of in the fire, if you will. And then as, as we come into those times of, of trials and those times of tribulations that that the, the, the things that are in our hearts actually rise to the surface. You know, whatever is there that isn't of the Lord is going to be seen rather quickly. You know, and we, and we talked about, you know, you usually, when a cup is full, and you bump that cup, whatever is in that cup is going to spill out all over you. You know, and so, so that drop begins to rise to the surface, and then the Holy Spirit just comes and just skims it across just takes it across. And so that's why I, I find it interesting, you know, for so many years, and so recently as I'm studying this, I'm thinking, you know, I used to pray, Lord, do a deep work in my heart. You know, do something really deep. And really the work that God does of taking that stuff off of our life is really a shallow one. You know, it, it rises to the surface. It comes up. You know, it's not something that, has, that we have to ponder our navels and we have to kind of self-examine ourselves. And I know a lot of people that, that do that. They sit around and they, they just examine themselves all day long. You know, oh man, I wonder what's really going on in my heart. Yeah. And let me tell you something. When you focus on yourself all the time, you know what it does? It makes you depressed. Because who wants to focus on themselves? That's a depressing subject. To focus on yourself. Rather focus on the Lord. Focus on the goodness of God. That is an uplifting thing to think about. And if there's something in your heart, it's going to come up to the surface. You don't have to gaze down into your navel or contemplate your deep thoughts. It's going to be right there in front of your eyes. And then the Holy Spirit just comes and He just takes it away. He just skims it off the top. I love that. That when I really caught that, it just set me free from so much. 
Now, I, I don't have to sit there and think about myself. I wonder what I was thinking about now. The Lord will make it real evident. It'll be, if, if, if the Lord doesn't make it evident, then Mark, you will. Um, it's just all right there on the surface, you know. My friends will make it evident to me. Verse 6, do not exalt yourself in the presence of the king. Do not stand in the place of the great. For it is better that he say to you, come up here, than that you should be put lower in the presence of the prince whom your eyes have seen. You know, when you go into a gathering, don't just go up and sit in the prominent place. You know, don't just kind of saunter up and sit next to the guest of honor. Better to take the lowest place and be invited up. You know, to the main to the main place. Now, and I remember being in a couple of situations where, you know, we had uh, we were invited by some people that were, you know, we were their guests, you know, and so they wanted us to sit next to them, and they were organizing this event, and but we noticed that there was someone already in the chair, you know, so we thought, oh, that's okay, we'll we'll just kind of sit over here. And next thing I know, those people that are sitting next to our friends, they're being politely asked to get up, to move out of the way, and then we, they, they get us, and they bring us over, and they put us in that spot. Better to be in that position than to be in the position of those first people where they're being asked to kind of move out of the way. Verse 8, do not hastily go to court, for what will you do in the end when your neighbor has put you to shame? Debate your case with your neighbor, and do not disclose the secret to another. Lest he who hears it expose your shame, and your reputation be ruined. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. You know, when, when it comes to legal matters, you know, try to deal with it outside of the public arena. You know, once you go to court, it becomes public. It's a public thing. Rather to deal with things privately, you know, as much as you can. And then he says, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. You know, some people just have the gift of being able to say the right thing at the right time. You know, I wish I had that gift. Uh, I don't have that gift. I tend to say the wrong thing, and then I get people mad at me. You know, but there are, uh, there are those who, uh, you're just in awe of. Because they walk in and they can calm any situation by just saying the right thing. You know, a word fitly spoken. Verse 12, like an earring of gold uh, and an ornament of fine gold is a wise rebuker to the obedient ear. Like the cold of snow in time of harvest is a faithful messenger to those who send him. For he refreshes the soul of his master. Whoever falsely boasts of giving is like clouds and wind without rain. By long forbearance, a ruler is persuaded, and a gentle tongue breaks a bone. Have you found honey? Eat only as much as you need, lest you be filled with it and vomit. Seldom set food uh, foot in your neighbor's house, lest you become weary of you and hate you. You know, you're just kind of at your neighbor's house, you're just sitting there, and, you know, they got stuff to do, and you're just kind of hanging out, and, you know, everyone's like, how do we tell these people to leave our house? I remember we were at some people's house, uh, at some friend's house, and, and at, about, at about 10 o'clock, you know, everybody's having a good time, and the wife would just say, good night, everybody, I'm going to bed, and then they would leave. Mm-hmm. And about 15 minutes, minutes later, the husband would go, good night, everybody, I'm going to bed. And here we are in these people's houses, and they're gone, you know, we're just kind of like, what do we do? We overstayed our welcome, you know, uh, and he says, don't do that. Uh, verse 18, a man who bears false witness against his neighbor is like a club, a sword, and a sharp arrow. Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a bad tooth and a foot out of joint. Like one who takes away a garment in cold weather and like vinegar on soda is one who sings songs to a heavy heart. Have you ever taken uh, like vinegar and put it in a baking soda? You know, how it just causes this, this chemical reaction. That's what it's like when you sing songs to a heavy heart. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. For so you will heap coals of fire on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Now, what does this mean, heap coals of fire on the head? Well, some suggest 
that it means that you will cause your enemy to burn with shame and guilt because they were so mean to you. Um, and, and that you were nice to them. You know, others suggest that it's a good thing. When uh, you know, heaping warm uh, coals on their heads is, is kind of a good thing. You know, it was a way of providing warmth for someone and caring for someone. And so, uh, by taking care of your enemy, by warming your enemy with your uh, actions, the Lord will reward you. You know, so when you're good to those that are even evil against you, when you're when they're enemies against you, and yet you treat them kindly. It's the Lord that is going to reward you, even if they don't recognize it. The Lord will recognize it, and he'll bless you. Verse 23, the north wind brings forth rain, and a backbiting tongue, and angry countenance. It is better to dwell in a corner of a housetop than a house shared with a contentious woman. As cold water to a weary soul, so is good news from a far country. A righteous man who falters before the wicked is like a murky spring and a polluted well. It is not good to eat much honey, so to seek one's own glory is not glory. So it's not when you seek your own glory, it is not glory. Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. You know, a man that is constantly getting angry. You know, they're constantly being, there's no rule over their spirit. They're constantly getting upset. It's like a city with broken walls. Now, Proverbs 26. The first 12 address, uh, verses of Proverbs 26 addresses fools. And so we pray that it doesn't apply to anyone here in this room uh, tonight. <laughs> Verse 1, it says, As snow in summer and rain in harvest, so honor is not fitting for a fool. Now, snow in summer and rain in harvest. What's wrong with that picture? Snow in summer. It doesn't have. It's, it's, it's out of place. Snow in summer is out of place. Rain in harvest is out of place. And so to give honor to a fool is out of place. You know, it just doesn't make sense. Like a fitting sparrow, like a flying swallow, so a curse without cause shall not alight. You know, the idea is basically if someone curses you for no reason, don't worry about it. It's not going to affect you. You know, if they lay a charge against you and it's not true, don't worry about it. It's not going to affect you. It won't land on you. Verse 3, a whip for the horse, a bridle for the donkey, and a rod for the fool's back. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you also be like him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. So there's two admission, admonitions concerning answering a fool. The first says, don't answer a fool, because you're just wasting your time. So he's going to pull you down with him. You know, you're going to tell him something, and he's just going to twist it around, and pull you down. The second says, answer a fool according to his folly, or confronting his folly. It says, answer a fool according, lest he be wise in his own eyes. In other words, if you're, if you're trying to confront his folly, you know, and, and, and bring it to light, he's just going to twist it around, and he's, in his eyes, he's going to see himself as smarter than you. And so sometimes there's just... It's just best when you got someone that's just a fool, just let them be a fool. Just let them, let them be. Don't try to educate them. Don't try to teach them. Just let them be. Verse 6. He who sends a message by the hand of a fool cuts off his own feet and drinks violence. Like the legs of the lame that hang limp is a proverb in the mouth of fools. Like one who binds a stone in a sling is he who gives honor to a fool. You don't bind a stone in a sling, right? You want the stone to be loose so that you, when you flip it, it'll fly. You don't bind it in there. So, like when it binds a stone in a sling, is he who gives honor to a fool. Like a thorn that goes into the hand of a drunkard is a proverb in the mouth of fools. The great God who formed everything gives the fool his hire and the transgressor his wages. In other words, 
you know, they're going to get what they got coming to them. You know, they'll get theirs in, in due time. You don't have to give it to them. You don't have to be the one to straighten them out. God's going to take care of them. Verse 11, as a dog returns to his own vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Now, the first 11 verses are talking about fools. But there is one thing worse off than a fool. Only one thing. And that is a man who is wise in his own eyes. And you can almost say that the first 11 verses are the build-up to this one verse. That really, he's kind of laying out, this is a fool, but there's one worse than a fool. He's kind of building a case and saying, this is the ultimate, and that is a person who is wise in his own eyes. There's more hope for a fool than that person. And so, uh, and so uh, you can look at it that way. Now, in verses 13, we turn to the lazy man. So, the law of Proverbs has a lot to say about fools, and it has a lot to say about lazy men. It says in verse 13, The lazy man says, There is a lion in the road, a fierce lion is in the street. You know, in other words, any excuse to keep from doing any work. Oh, I can't go out today. It's a bad day. It's going to be crazy. It could be terrible out there. You know, that's a lazy man's thinking. As the door turns on its hinges, so does the lazy man on his bed. The lazy man buries his hand in the bowl, and it wearies him to bring it back to his mouth. He's so lazy, he can't even bring it out of the bowl where the fruit is, up to his mouth to, to feed himself. The lazy man is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. You know, the lazy man always has a reason why they can't get a job. Why they can't work. Why they can't move. Oh, I can't do it now. Why can't you do it? Well, you know... You, just can't do it because then I got to do this, and now and I can't do that. I just don't have the money. I don't have a car. I don't. They always got a reason. They're wiser in their own eyes. Verse 17: He who passes by and meddles in a quarrel, not his own, is like one who takes the dog by the ear. In other words, you're going to get bit. You get in somebody else's business, you're going to get bit. You know that's the the police officers will tell you the most dangerous calls that they get are domestic, you know, violence calls. Because they get into those calls and they're meddling to someone else's business and as soon as they get in the door, they get turned on. You know, they get they get attacked themselves. Like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and death is a man who deceives his neighbor and says, I was only joking. You know, hey, I didn't mean that. You know, I was just kidding you. You know, like a madman. Where there is no wood, the fire goes out, and where there is no tailbearer, strife ceases. Now, as charcoal is to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. The words of a tailbearer are like tasty trifles. They go down into the inmost body. You know, verse 21, it mentions charcoal. You know, charcoal is hard to light. You know, you can't easily light charcoal. The way you light charcoal is you have to put them next to other coals that are on fire, and then over time, the charcoal lights. And that's uh, what a contentious man is like, that's, that kindles strife. You know, it's hard to kindle strife within a group of people. But you get one contentious person that's complaining or finding fault, and the next thing you know, they'll start... You know, one by one, as people get next to that coal, that burning coal, they'll start, you know, igniting a fire throughout, one by one. You know, you can always tell a contentious person, because over a short period of time, they're going to find fault with you. They're going to find something wrong with you. Whereas, love covers. Love covers a multitude of things. And I can guarantee you, if, if we sat here long enough in this room, we could probably all find something that we just don't like that about each other. And within a period of about 15 or 20 minutes, we would hate each other so much that we would never come back. You know, we could all find that. But to love one another, as Christ loves us, I think about how Jesus loves me. 
and what Jesus puts up in my own life. And how, you know, if there's ever a moment that my chair should be nuked and there should be a brown, big old black spot where I used to sit, I mean, that, that moment can happen several times a day. And yet God in His grace, God in His mercy and His forgiveness, He overlooks all of that. He looks at me and He sees Jesus. He sees the future and the hope that He has for us. He sees the plan that He has for us. He sees the end product when we arrive in glory. He sees it all because He's seeing from a different vantage point than you and I. He's seeing it from the vantage point of eternity. And so He just sees us and He sees us through that lens of love. And He treats us that way. You know, so rather than finding fault uh, with each other, love one another. You know, and encourage each other. Verse 23, Fervent lips with a wicked heart are like earthenware covered with silver dross. Now, silver dross was used to coat a clay pot and it made it look a lot more expensive than what it was. You know, it made it look really valuable. They have this silver kind of coating over it, and so it looks a lot better, more expensive than just a simple clay pot. And that's what fervent lips are with a wicked heart. You know, it looks good. They can build a good case, but it's not a good case. You know, it's wickedness encased in uh, trying to settle it off and make it look good. Verse 24, he who hates disguises it with his lips. (laughs) <laughs> you know, they say that in all comedy there's a little truth, right? And uh, he who hates disguises it with his lips and lays up deceit within himself. When he speaks kindly, do not believe him, for there are seven abominations in his heart. There's that word abomination again. Though his hatred is covered by deceit, his wickedness will be revealed before the assembly. Whoever digs a pit will fall into it, and he who rolls a stone will have it roll back on him. A lying tongue hates those who are crushed by it, and a flattering mouth works ruin. And, you know, it might be my cynical mind, but, you know, I'm always suspicious of someone that just flatters me all the time. Where, not, not where they compliment me, but where they're they're flattering me. They don't know me. And they start saying things about me that they possibly can't know. You know, they start building me up. And, you know, they're not really telling the truth. You know, because they really don't know me. You know, but those that know me and they compliment me, okay, I, I like that. You know, because I, I know that, that, they, that, they're, that they're sincere in that. But those that are kind of flattering, they're not telling the truth. They're really concealing what's in their heart. And what's in their heart really is hatred, is what Solomon said. You know, it's envious. They're envious of you. You know, oftentimes in the positions and some of the jobs I've held where I've dealt with um, celebrities and different artists, and you have people that want to become celebrities, and so, you know, they'll, they'll, and they know that you're the way to them become, you're, the, you're kind of the gatekeeper, you're the, the person that's going to help them get to where they want to be. And it could be, in my case, it was my particular job. In your case, it could be a management job, it could be you're the owner of a company or whatever it is, and they see you as their future. You're going you're gonna to open the doors that are going to make them famous, and so they start flattering you. You know, they start buttering you up or whatever. They, do, they don't really like you. You know, they really actually hate you because they want to be you. And in order to be you, they have to kill you. You know? And that's really what's going on inside of their heart. And really what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to speak the truth and love to one another. Not flatter one another. You know, we're supposed to speak the truth in love. And that's, you know, oftentimes when we read that, you know, we tend to think it negatively. Like, bro, I'm going to tell you the truth in love. You know, you really suck. But I love you anyway. You know, that's usually what we want to tell people. But that word, speaking the truth in love, has not just to do with the negative, but with the positive. 
you know, coming alongside and really speaking into someone's life and saying, you know what, this is what I see God doing in you, and it is so awesome. You know, and being able to speak truth that that uh, encourages and builds up and strengthens. You know, and we're to speak the truth in love. But really, my weakness is often I'll speak the truth, but I don't always speak it in love. You know, I, sometimes I, I'm one of those guys that that um, I'll speak the truth, but sometimes it's really a dig, right? And I'm, I'm speaking the truth, but it's really a dig, or, or I'm speaking the truth, and, and it's really an attack. You know, I get defensive, and so I'll speak the truth, and, it, and it's more of an attack as opposed to uh, being spoken with the intent of encouraging and building up and, and loving and and if you're perceptive and intuitive, and if the Holy Spirit gives you any kind of insight, you know, we all know that we can speak those words of truth that can really, uh, really hurt a person, you know, in their deepest part, because God will show you things, and in people's hearts will show you their weaknesses. But God wants us to speak the truth in love. Because the, the goal of speaking truth is not to defend the truth. The goal is not to be right or to correct wrong. The goal is love. The goal is love. And to bring that person into a love relationship with Jesus Christ. And to bring that person into a love relationship with the body of Christ. So that they can receive the love of God. Because as we receive the love of God, our hearts change we become more like Him. And we want to please Him. We want to follow Him. We want to be like Him. And those that are out there, they just feel like they have to correct everything. They have to, you know, make sure that everybody is perfect. Everyone is right all the time. Sometimes they're not really in it for love. There's actually something else going on in their heart. You know, an insecurity a fear. They don't feel like they belong. They don't feel accepted by God. They don't feel welcome in the family of God. They don't feel loved by God. And so their whole identity is built on I have to be right. Because now if I'm right, then I belong. And I can prove I belong because I'm right. And if you're trying to be right in your own rightness, I would call that your own righteousness. You'll always be wrong. Because our righteousness will never be enough. That's why we need Jesus. His righteousness is perfect. And he takes his righteousness and he gives it to you and me. And he says, I have made you righteous with my righteousness. So now when, I, when he looks at us, we're perfect. Why? Because we're of our own righteousness? No. Because he looks at us in his righteousness. We have his righteousness now. And so speaking the truth of love, we don't have to lie, we don't have to flatter. We can speak the truth to one another. Build each other up. Build love in one another. Speaking the truth and love. Next week we'll continue with, uh, we'll kind of finish the book, chapter 27 through 31. And uh, we'll complete Proverbs, and uh, and then the week after that, I think we start Ecclesiastes next. Yeah. So, um, uh, is that after Proverbs is Ecclesiastes? Yeah. yeah. So, um, so Ecclesiastes is uh, is the book that Solomon wrote when he was backslidden from the Lord. So we've gotten from the we're gonna we've been in the wisdom of God, and as we go through Ecclesiastes, we're gonna hear the pinnacle of man's wisdom. Man's wisdom, you know, not necessarily God's wisdom for living, but man's wisdom, you know, the, the best you can get without God, you know, broken in your relationship with God. And that's why all throughout the book, Solomon says, vanity of vanities. All, everything is vanity. You know, it's all work under the sun. You know, he, and he has this fatalistic view of life because he's doing it without the Lord. You know, and finally he comes to the sentence and he says, here's the beginning of wisdom, the spirit of the Lord. We need to be, we need to be right with God. 
finally comes to his senses and gets that way. And so uh, that would be an, an interesting study. Father, thank you for your word to us, Lord. We, we look forward to seeing you work in our lives, Lord. And Lord, we thank you for the work that you've already done. And Lord, that we would be a wise people. Lord, that we would be a people that are moving in love, that are operating in love, Lord, that are operating in wisdom, that are following after the ways, your ways, which are the wise ways. And so, Lord, do that work in our hearts. As we prayed in the beginning, Lord, that prayer of surrender, Lord, even as we sang, Lord, uh, we surrender all to you, Lord. Lord, we recognize that this life is moment by moment surrendering to you and allowing you to have your place in our life as the Lord of our life. Lord, you're not Savior or Lord. You're just Lord. And because you are Lord, you have saved us. And you have redeemed us and given us a place in the hands of you. Given us a future. And you've blessed us with favor here on earth. And so, Lord, continue to work in our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right.